The Sarasota County Bar Association is a proud partner in bringing you the law in Sarasota. With voluntary membership of over 900 lawyers and judges, the Sarasota County Bar Association is your community's leader in advancing legal professionalism, practice development, and public service. Visit www.sarasotabar.com for more information and to use the online directory list to find an attorney. We have on the panel today two lawyers who are experienced with both mediation and arbitration. Let me introduce them. First, we have Gary Larson. Gary, welcome. Thank you. Now, Gary is a shareholder with Dickinson Gibbons Law Firm in Sarasota. For many years, he was an active trial lawyer an experience that gives them insight into the often harsh realities of litigation. He has a very busy practice that has now evolved into his being hired as a mediator in a wide range of cases in federal and state courts. These include personal injury, products liability, and construction law disputes, among others. He has been awarded the prestigious AV preeminent rating from Martindale Hubble, which is a significant accomplishment and he's a former president of the Sarasota County Bar Association. In a former life, Gary was a stand-up comedian, a skill that serves him well as a mediator. To survive as a mediator, you probably need to have a sense of humor. We also have us with us today, Drew Clayton. He's an attorney with the Eichert Merrill Law Firm here in Sarasota. Drew has an extensive trial experience in complex commercial litigation before developing an expertise representing clients who find themselves in arbitration. His practice is now focused on representing clients in securities litigation disputes between investors and stockbrokers. But he's done a variety of other types of arbitration cases too. He was invited by the Florida Office of Financial Regulation to serve on an advisory panel charged with the responsibility of detecting and reporting large-scale securities fraud, such as Ponzi schemes. He served his community as a president of the Players Theater, and he started a Boy Scout troop. He's another example of bar members who contribute spare time to worthy projects in their hometown. Like Gary, Drew has an AV rating by Martindale Hubble. Both of these have been recognized as Florida super lawyers. Both have been hired as mediators, and they have represented clients before mediators and arbitrators. Today, they're going to share their insights and experience with us. So, we'll start first with mediation. Gary, just tell me, what is mediation? Well, mediation, formally, is something that can be court-ordered or voluntary, and it's an opportunity for people to step off the path to the courthouse and come into a confidential environment where a person like myself, as a neutral party, assist them in attempting to negotiate a resolution of their dispute. Well, does it happen at the courthouse? No, it usually does not happen at the courthouse. It'll happen in offices, uh, wherever it's convenient for the parties to meet. You mentioned that um, it can happen without there being a lawsuit being filed. What do you call that? Well, pre-suit mediation. I mean, what's happened is that a lot of people have recognized that there are disputes where people are seeking resolution to things that will not be accomplished in a courtroom. The courtroom may just be destructive. So if you can get a case to a mediator early and you can solve a problem, well, you've saved money and you've accomplished a better result. Well, tell me, who <laughs> attends a mediation? Uh, who are the players? Sometimes there's a lot. If you have a family dispute over a will contest, oh, you may have you know, relatives and lawyers and all kinds of people. But often you have an attorney for the plaintiff, the plaintiff themselves, and then you have a defendant, and if it's an insurance case, an insurance company representative. In a medical malpractice case, you would have the doctor there live. You know, any number of people can attend. So if a person, uh, one of the parties has to pay money or is exposed to paying money, uh, does the person who attends for that party have authority to settle? Well, they should. That's a pretty loaded question. I mean, arguably, people should come to a mediation with authority. Well, let's talk about a court-ordered mediation. Uh, how does that happen, and what types of cases are we talking about? Well, some by contract, some because the jurisdictions require everything to be mediated. In Pinellas County, for instance, you can't get a trial date without a mediation. In Sarasota, many of the judges order cases to mediation at an early juncture, and so that's how people get to mediation. I think 
almost every family law case gets sent to mediation. When there's a high conflict case, particularly, they're going to be sent to mediation. So um, the goal, uh, what would you describe the goals of mediation to be? To me? Yes. Being a mediator, I have two goals. First, to help educate people as to the reality of their case. You know, all the facts they think exist, all the emotions. Some of those things will never be heard by a court. And judges don't have the jurisdiction to do the things they think they want. So the first thing is educate them as to the risk. The second thing is to evaluate that risk and bring the parties to a mutually acceptable place where everyone's interests are served. I know there's a wide variety of cases that can go to mediation, and I know you've had experience, particularly on the hip replacement uh, type of litigation. Tell me about that. How many cases or types of cases of that type would you get? Well, just because I fell into that area, and I've done maybe 35 to 45 all over the country, and it's a very unique setting in which the plaintiff's lawyers are a limited group, the defense lawyers are a limited group. Once you know them and they trust you, they tend to rely upon you as that guy in the middle to try to bring resolution. So these were people that had a de allegedly a defective uh, hip replacement uh, uh, device, mm -hmm. and they're suing now the products company. Is that well? They're, or they or they have made it known that they intend to bring a claim, or they've been brought into some form of litigation. There again, the goal is try to get to things early before all the money's been spent, all the blood's been spilled that kind of sometimes takes you away from resolution. Have you been surprised at the number of cases that appear to be intractable? There's no way they appear they're gonna settle out and they go to mediation and something happens in, in that room or during that process that results in settlement. I used to be surprised, but I've been doing this now for 10 years full time every day. And now, it's what I hope for and expect. I know that sounds naive maybe, but if people can really understand that of their experience, which is gonna be translated into the courtroom, and that which the court can do, nine times out of 10, we can solve the problem. Sometimes it's just money, but often in business cases or interpersonal, intercompany disputes, we can solve it without money being exchanged. How do you get a person who's adamantly fixed on a position to consider issues that uh, may not be in their best interest and they really do need to seriously consider a settlement but they uh, they're just so tied up to this position that it's hard to let go are there t techniques or approaches that you use that help well to me the only approach you can really use is to be honest with them to hope they have a good lawyer who also cares about being realistic about what they can advocate and then examining with them you know, what's your risk here? What's the value of that risk? And what's your need to take it? Well, I know you were a board certified uh, civil trial attorney. And as a result of that experience, you probably have insight into the strengths and weaknesses of a case. Uh, how far can you go to explain those uh, with their lawyer sitting there? The lawyer might have had a position that says, oh, you got a great case. But you as a trial lawyer looking at this, you're saying, and a mediator saying, this, this has got some problems. How do you address that? Well, that's a kind of personal issue because there are different types of mediators. Some just carry numbers. I don't want to be that kind of mediator. I hope anyone who hires me knows that I want to help them analyze the case. Not tell them what to do, but help them analyze the case. Because any lawsuit is a business equation, ultimately. How much money are we putting into it? What do we need to get a trial to net a certain amount for our client if we have medical bills to pay and legal costs to pay? If we can do a positive thing in mediation, then you really have to balance what's going to happen at trial. Are these public? Can anybody come to a mediation? No. Mediations, arguably, somebody that's not a true party could attend if everybody agreed, but I would have them sign a confidentiality agreement so that it was clear that what was said and done at the mediation stayed private. That's the strength of it. When they talk to me privately, I don't repeat a word unless they let me. When we work together to try to solve a case, if we can't, guess what? The judge and jury never hear a word. So if a person goes to mediation and it fails and then wants to stand up in court and say, well, you said this in mediation, what that happens? It doesn't happen. It's got to be, uh, uh, it's not allowed. You can't utter a word. I've only had one case where somebody foolishly, after a mediation in a public case, made a comment to the press. I think the judge was going to fine him $20,000. Don't know if he ever did, yeah. but no, it's not 
public and that's what makes it powerful. In the old days, lawyers didn't talk to each other like this. Yeah. Well, so if you, um, if you have a party there that's uh, just very resistant to hearing, do you try to point out the weaknesses? Look, I try to be fair and listen to them, and then I try to suggest that they hang out in the world that the lawyer hangs out in. You know, you can think something, you can feel something, but if you can't translate it into admissible evidence, does it matter? And do you talk about how a jury might be reactive to their particular case, strength or weaknesses? All the time. You have to look at the person themselves, uh, how they will appeal or be seen by the potential jury. I mean, a jury in Bradenton is generally different than a jury in Sarasota because the demographics of those two communities are different. So we're always thinking about that, always. Okay, so let's, let's talk about, um, you've talked about the confidentiality. Uh, what happens when you reach an agreement? How is that formalized? We reduce it to writing. Who does it? The parties do it. Now, I will assist the parties by bringing a form or by suggesting language, but to preserve my confidentiality, I take the position that it should be the party's document because they're the ones who are going to sign it and be bound by its terms. So the idea is the meeting of the minds that uh, occurred during the mediation is actually expressed clearly in the, in the settlement agreement. And then if it's a court order mediation, what happens after that? I file a report with the court that says one of two things. Case was mediated in impasse or the case was mediated and settled. The document itself that settles the case is not filed with the court unless it's needed to be filed for purposes of enforcement. So actually, uh, you're, you're actually trying to bring the parties together to understand the strengths and weaknesses, but your role is not to make the decision that you win or you lose. No, that's the luxury and the joy of being a mediator. You get to be deadly honest in a kind way, but those are just your opinions. People are free to make their own decisions, and I always tell someone, if you really want to go to trial, if that's what you choose, then go to trial. But I always beg them to use their head, not their heart, because that's a different set of decisions. Can you resolve it all at one sitting or do you have to have multiple sittings? No, I just had a case uh, last week involving the death of a 20-month-old child, a medical malpractice case. Very difficult emotionally. We needed it once months ago. Issues arose that kept us apart. We kind of agreed to table the mediation, take some discovery. It was targeted. They came back together and we settled the case. So how do mediators get paid? Well, that's another good thing about mediation. I'm not forced on anyone. People must all agree to the mediator, and each party pays the mediator the same amount of money regardless of whether the case settles or not. So I don't even have the potential for a financial interest in the case. Is it typically an hourly rate? Typically an hourly rate. Most mediators like myself, uh, I travel all over the state, and I have set blocks of time that you purchase. If it exceeds that, you pay more. If it doesn't, you pay the block. Well, let me do a public service announcement here for <laughs> folks that uh, may not be involved in the level of litigation that, that you are. Uh, the 12th Judicial Circuit and many other circuits maintain in-house mediators. And in family cases, for a relatively small amount of money, I think it's $60 or so, uh, folks can get their, um, their family cases mediated. And indig indigent folks can get it done for nothing. So I would uh, suggest to any of our audience members that happen to have uh, issues of that type uh, to consider. There's an indigency cutoff, an income cutoff, but uh, I think it's $100,000 of net estate. Uh, they can go up to that amount. Over that, they have to retain private mediators. But a lot of folks do fall into that range for free mediation through our court services. And in county court, uh, we have a pre-litigation mitigation, uh, a mediation service, so that say neighbors get into a dispute or they're quarreling over some relatively minor financial issue, they can request before they even go to court to have one of our court uh, mediators assigned to try to talk them into uh, resolving the case without having to fight over it. And they can also do it afterwards too. The county court judges uh, routinely refer cases to our in-house mediators to resolve cases. Yeah. That's one of the secrets is that a mediator can allow the parties to work together to accomplish a resolution that a judge will not have the jurisdiction to accomplish. All right. Now we're going to contrast that with arbitration. So, Drew, let's, let's talk about arbitration. Um, do people have a choice to arbitrate? Yes. Yeah, arbitration is a matter of contract. So the only way you get to arbitration is if all parties agree to it. Well, there's a lot of arbitration that is 
put in the fine print of contracts. Can you give me some examples of the types of cases that are arbitrated? Well, sure. I mean, my practice has for, for many years involved cases against big brokerage firms. So anytime anybody opens an account with a Merrill Lynch or a Morgan Stanley or whatever, there, there will inevitably be somewhere in the fine print an arbitration provision which says that there are any disputes, they're going to be arbitrated. But there are also many other kinds of arbitration provisions that people will find and <clears throat> for instance their credit card accounts very often have, almost always in fact, will have an arbitration provision. So uh, arbitration surfaces in a lot of different contexts. I noticed online if you do like uh, purchases through Amazon or some of these other websites, down there in the fine print, which we always collect that we've checked that we've read it, is going to be an arbitration clause. So if you get in a dispute with most of these online folks, just expect arbitration. Right. So let's contrast that to the mediation process. What would you say the big difference is? Well, the biggest difference, and as Gary alluded to, is that in mediation, the parties have the power to decide the outcome, whereas in arbitration, it's the arbitrators. So who picks the arbitrators? The parties pick the arbitrators. Now the rules are different. There are a number of different arbitration forums. The one that I'm most involved with is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. It's called FINRA for short. So in the FINRA proceedings, we get lists of proposed arbitrators and if we don't already have backgrounds on them, we look into their backgrounds and try to see if we can figure out any biases. So we select, we rank arbitrators, not unlike a jury uh, selection process. Um, I can't speak to how some of the other arbitration forums operate. We talked for a, a moment ago about the credit card dispute. I don't know specifically how it operates, but I believe those are typically assigned a particular arbitrator. I don't think the parties in that situation get a chance to select the arbitrator. Well, I know I've handled a number of uh, construction type cases as a judge, and uh, they have this thing called AAA. Correct. Uh, which is the American Arbitration uh, Association and they typically um, will put a provision for the matter to be arbitrated at AAA. How does that type of arbitration work? Yeah, it's similar to, uh, to what I described with FINRA a moment ago. You do get a chance to select from a panel of arbitrators. The American Arbitration Association has been around for a long time. Uh, from what I understand, in the last three years or so, they had about 20,000 arbitration cases run through their system. Now, those arbitration cases, they may be construction disputes, they could be consumer disputes. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, it, it's somewhat similar in the sense that you do get a chance to select the arbitrators. So let's say that, uh, let's talk about something other than the brokerage uh, situation. Sure. Um, do you have, do the parties have a chance to object to the arbitrators? Yes. Yeah, there, there are, and again, there are a variety of different arbitration forums, and each of those forums have got their own rules. But yes, there are circumstances under which the parties can object. But ultimately... Uh, an arbitrator will be imposed on the parties if they don't agree on one. Theoretically, uh, I think one of the advantages of arbitration has always been that certain technical types of cases are better in front of an arbitrator who has expertise in that field. For example, a complicated architectural issue or engineering or mechanical issue uh, goes in front of some arbitrator who has a resume that shows expertise in that field. Uh, have you had that experience? Yes. Yeah. Our arbitrators are not necessarily lawyers or former judges, although there are plenty of those on arbitration panels. It's not at all unusual, as you mentioned, in a AAA setting to have arbitrators that maybe have some particular experience that's valuable for that kind of case. And of course, in the kinds of cases I handle, in theory, the arbitrators are supposed to have some experience with the investment business. I heard uh, one commercial um, entity suggesting that their arbitration process was better for the consumer because it was cheaper than trials. Is that necessarily true? <clears throat> it's a mixed bag. Um, to be perfectly candid with you, arbitration has been a creature uh, promoted by business for the most part. It's, it's been helpful for mostly big businesses in order to reduce their legal fees. Uh, and uh, for consumers, uh, it's not necessarily a good deal. Now, what, what I will tell you is that it can be extremely expensive, if not impossible, for many consumers to pay for an attorney to represent them when there's not a great deal of money involved. However, it doesn't necessarily mean the outcome is going to be much better. There's been a lot of criticism in the press over the last uh, decade or so about these, we talk about these credit card type arbitrations. 
And it's rare, I think, for attorneys to be involved in representing consumers in that context because it's difficult to justify the economics. But for the consumers who go into that kind of arbitration, from what I understand, uh, the outcome is oftentimes uh, not very favorable. So they may save money on legal fees, but it doesn't mean they get a good outcome. Yeah, generally speaking, uh, the consumers um, complain they don't really get as fair a shake as they think they would get with a jury. On the other hand, it may not be as expensive for them as it would be having to hire lawyers and to do that. Correct. So um, the uh, folks that, um, that you've experienced with it, uh, are they satisfied, your clients? But basically, uh, I'm sure yours are all happy with it. But Boy, I hope I'm, so. <laughs> are, there, are there some, yeah. I mean, are there, have you seen situations where you thought maybe it would have been better in front of a jury? Yes. Yeah, one, of the, um, one of the difficulties in arbitration, and, and there are some similarities in a court setting, but <clears throat> we really don't uh, try as we might to select the best arbitrators we can. We don't always know who is really truly going to be capable of uh, listening to a case, uh, managing a case, uh, because these people are not, they're not experienced judges. They don't know how to handle evidence. The evidentiary rules in arbitration are relaxed, and so that can lead to a bit of a Wild West scenario at times. Um, so it creates uncertainty in the outcome, and so there have certainly been situations when uh, when people I've represented, and Lord knows I've heard plenty of stories of others who have come out of an arbitration hearing shaking their head saying, wow, what just happened in there? Yeah. Well, so uh, is it a public hearing? No. Arbitration is private. In fact, one of the big reasons that it's been promoted over the years by, again, by, by the business community is that it really, um, it, it shields from public view the kinds of disputes that are going on out there. Uh, and so nobody can attend an arbitration other than the parties and their counsel and whatever witnesses they may call. But uh, the public is generally not aware of what's going on. Well, in a civil case, uh, for example, the ones that uh, Gary has, has uh, mediated, there is discovery. I mean, you basically get to see the cards that each side's gonna play. How does that work in, media, in arbitration? Discovery is more limited, um, which, which uh, lends uh, itself to that Wild West feel. Um, in arbitration, we can do requests for documents and very limited requests for information in, in the civil arena that would be called interrogatories. But it's uh, depositions, which is sworn testimony taken before court, generally is not uh, available in arbitration. So you get some surprises, I imagine, when you're arbitrating. And, and they can work to your advantage, but yes, <laughs> there, are some, there are some surprises. Double-edged sword, I think they would say. Correct. So um, isn't there a constitutional right to have a jury trial, both in federal and state uh, constitutions? You know, it's really interesting. There is a constitutional right, but the courts have also made it pretty clear over the, over the years uh, that arbitration, if, if a contract is put in front of somebody, a consumer who has no real bargaining ability, but they sign that contract anyway, they have essentially waived their right to a jury trial. I can imagine that comes as a surprise, particularly the cases I've seen where it's been surprising is nursing home cases. Uh, people will be admitting a relative into a nursing home, the relative or their guardian will sign off, not realizing that, boy, if they have a dispute, it's going to arbitration and they don't have a right to a jury trial. That's right, and that issue has been hotly litigated for decades. The Supreme Court came out with a series of decisions starting in about 1980 through, probably through the end of the 80s, uh, where the court made it abundantly clear that arbitration is, uh, is a favored means of dispute resolution, and if parties have signed an arbitration agreement, they're pretty much gonna be stuck with it. Well, these forms of alternate dispute resolution have the value for judges that keeps cases out of the court and hopefully resolves and keeps the case loads down. But if you have a panel of arbitrators, how do they, uh, say you got three arbitrators, how do they decide? It's by majority rule. And, uh, uh, and again, in the cases that I work with mostly, the arbitrators are not required to give a reasoned decision. So uh, they may have a few pages of administrative stuff before they, before they say one party wins or, or doesn't and how much they get. Well, if a, if a suit has been filed and then there's determined to be an arbitration clause and it goes to arbitration, how does that get enforced? Well, at, at the, and it, it changes depending on the forum. Um, in FINRA, uh, the, in the securities arbitrations, the industry, the securities industry itself will enforce the arbitration award, although we will routinely file something in state court, sometimes federal court, but typically in state court after the arbitration to confirm the arbitration award. 
And very often the reason we do it is because if there's an entitlement to recover attorney's fees, at least in the state of Florida, we can only get those fees awarded by a court in Florida. Can you appeal an arbitration award? Well, in theory you can, but in practice it's, it's virtually impossible. About the only way you could do it is if you could demonstrate some bias or corruption on the part of the panel. Okay. Lee, I need to mention, if you don't mind, that you know, I see a lot of cases that are headed for arbitration, like nursing home cases, that are still mediated first mm -hmm. because both sides recognize that expense that's still associated with it. So it doesn't have to be either or they can do both. Right. Correct. All right. Well, folks, that's about all the time we have here today. Um, so in closing, let me say that the big difference between mediation and arbitration is that mediation is an attempt to get the parties to find a way to voluntarily resolve their disputes between themselves. They're not forced to reach an agreement, but doing so can save a lot of litigation expense, not to mention stress. Mediators are the peacemakers. Arbitration can be expensive as trials, as an alternative, and resolves disputes without the parties having to agree with the result. If the, litigation, the litigants don't like the result in arbitration, they pretty much have to live with it. So word to the wise, look carefully at the contracts you sign in reality, you may not have much of a chance but to accept arbitration to get the goods or services you want. Just don't be surprised if you find your dispute being decided by an arbitrator and not a judge or a jury. We thank you for watching. This is Lee Hayworth signing off for Law and Sarasota. For more than 36 years, the Community Foundation of Sarasota County has worked one-on-one -on -one with estate planning attorneys and their clients to make a lasting impact through philanthropy. Stable, trusted, and knowledgeable, the Community Foundation safeguards the charitable legacies of donors to ensure that they continue for years to come. Visit www.cfsarasota.org or call 955-3000 for more information.